Let's find out what real-life horrific science inspired the novel Frankenstein. The experiments on human corpses that drove Mary Shelley to write this work. And how a real-life Frankenstein's monster scared a man to death. I'm going to show you in this episode how one of the most terrifying creatures in horror fiction was created and why. And whether or not the creation of Dr. Frankenstein's monster, this stitching together of body parts to create a new being, had any basis in fact. By the end of this film, you'll be an expert on Frankenstein, so keep watching. Hello, I'm Tony McMahon. I'm an investigative historian. You've probably seen me on a few TV documentaries, but enough of that because we're here to find out everything about Dr. Frankenstein's monster. And just to be a total pedant right at the start, Frankenstein is of course the doctor, Frankenstein's monster is what he created. So I'm glad we got that sorted at the outset. We're going to meet the real creator of Frankenstein, the female author who held her own among some very egotistic male authors in the early 19th century. Step forward, the marvellous Mary Shelley. And stick around because we're also going to look at how this creature was tackled by the movie industry and of course in our own time streaming series on the likes of Netflix. And do remember to subscribe as ever, hit the button for more horrific content like this. 200 years ago a completely wild party was thrown at a villa in Switzerland and out of that party came two of the greatest horror novels of all time. In 1816 on a stormy and thundery night Mary Shelley would emerge from this party having written Frankenstein while Lord Byron or possibly Dr Polidori, that's a subject of debate, would have written the Vampire. Present at this party were Mary Shelley and her husband Percy Bysshe Shelley who was a respected radical poet well known at the time. Also Lord Byron, a notorious louche aristocrat, a very decadent character and his friend who would later become his enemy Dr Polidori. While Byron and Polidori's play The Vampire was very popular at the time, it's now been totally eclipsed by Bram Stoker's Dracula which followed 60-70 years later, it's really Mary Shelley's Frankenstein that was the great literary output resulting from that evening of mayhem. The novel is based in Switzerland and it centres on a character called Dr. Frankenstein and he's imbued with the spirit of discovery that was a hallmark of the age and he sets out to create a human being from the parts of dead people. But instead of being a beautiful and wondrous creation this turns out to be a hideous creature that pursues its maker. The doctor manages to get away but the monster hides away in the Swiss mountains committing terrible crimes including the murder of Frankenstein's younger brother but that murder is pinned on a cousin of Frankenstein who is then tragically executed. Frankenstein catches up with his monster who then apologises profusely for having killed the doctor's younger brother, promises not to do it again and to live away from people if only he can have a mate. So Dr Frankenstein sets about creating a female mate for his monster but then has second thoughts and chucks all the female body parts into a lake. Being deprived of the mate he was promised really bugs the monster as you can imagine and in a fit of rage he kills Frankenstein's best friend Henry Clerval but worse is to follow. Dr Frankenstein is getting married but he's terrified that the monster is going to turn up and kill him. Well the monster does turn up but he kills his bride, the new bride of the doctor. The grief stricken doctor goes after his own creation and catches up with the monster in the arctic north but this journey into the icy cold has destroyed Dr Frankenstein's health and he dies and the monster is found weeping over the doctor, inconsolable. Now if you've been horrified so far remember to like the video. And of course 
click that subscribe button. Because of many of the movie and TV versions of the Frankenstein story that have departed from Mary Shelley's novel, we're used to the idea of this monster talking in grunts and groans and being a complete brute. But what surprises people when they read the novel is how philosophical, uh, even verbose, Frankenstein's monster is. I mean, my goodness, he really can talk when he wants to. He may be gigantic and distorted in proportions, but this is no thoughtless beast. His face may be concealed by long locks of ragged hair. His skin may resemble that of an ancient Egyptian mummy, but he has a heart and a soul nevertheless. The monster is driven into a murderous rage because he's rejected by his creator, essentially his father in a sense. He's also rejected by the rest of society. Dr. Frankenstein clearly hopes that his monster will die through just being neglected, but in fact the monster proves to be much more resilient than expected. When I say that Frankenstein's monster talks a lot, I mean, uh, to give you an example, when he's found over the body of Dr. Frankenstein, he utters these words, in his murder my crimes are consummated, the miserable series of my being is wound to a close. Oh Frankenstein, generous and self-devoted being. He goes on in that vein, um, showing his persuasion and eloquence that Mary Shelley notes about the monster. He expresses remorse for all the killings he's committed. He says, I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have strangled the innocent as they slept and grasped to death his throat who never injured me or any other living being. The monster realizes that he must die in order to put things right and he says, I shall ascend my funeral pyre triumphantly and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. And then he lumbers off to certain death in the arctic winds and we're, we're so used to uh, this kind of um, lumbering fool of a monster from Hollywood that uh, it's such a surprise to meet this creature who philosophizes and feels very sorry for himself. So what influenced Mary Shelley to write such a book? Well, you have to understand the seismic events that were happening in England at that time and the great scientific discoveries that were being made. In 1816, when this party happened, it was just a year after the Battle of Waterloo and the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte by England, and experiments were being conducted with electricity in front of exhilarated and fascinated crowds. Electricity is something that we take for granted, it's lighting me now from both sides, but in Mary Shelley's time, it was something that was only beginning to be fully understood and harnessed. And when she wrote Frankenstein, she undoubtedly had a certain scientist, an Italian scientist, in mind. Luigi Galvani had been using electricity to get frogs' legs to twitch, and then he moved on to a dog. Well, it was only a matter of time before galvanism, as it came to be known, would be used to reanimate a human being. Now, the human beings that were being reanimated through galvanism were, of course, dead. Now, where did these dead bodies come from? Well, they were often the bodies of executed criminals. And by a stroke of good fortune, the scaffold where many criminals were hanged outside Newgate Prison was just a stone's throw from the surgeon's hall on the Old Bailey. So the bodies came from the place of execution directly to the doctors to be dissected, and they were often still nice and warm. So for example, a certain Mr. Foster who had murdered his wife and was hanged was brought rapidly to the theater to be reanimated through the power of electricity. Now I have to paint a picture for you here because operating theaters at this time 
had audiences gathered around the operating table. I mean, there wasn't much uh, concern over germ control. In fact, antiseptic and anaesthetic were still to be uh, deployed in operating theatres, so the whole thing was pretty gruesome. Anyway, Mr. Foster was brought in, dead, and then reanimated with electricity. Now, one eyewitness account says that his eyes opened and then he struck out with his right arm. No doubt the right arm used to kill his wife. He hit a uh, medical orderly, a medical assistant, who then promptly had a heart attack and died. So Mr. Foster was even killing people beyond death. Around the time that Mary Shelley was writing Frankenstein, the very dashing scientist Michael Faraday was conducting experiments with electromagnetism. Faraday combined science with showmanship, but it's thanks to him that we have electric motors, as well as the words electrode and cathode. One forgotten influence on Mary Shelley was the grandfather of Charles Darwin, the scientist who gave us the theory of evolution. Erasmus Darwin was a great scientific mind of the time, and he preserved a single cell organism called a vorticella under a glass lid. Now the story goes that Mary Shelley overheard a conversation between Lord Byron and her husband Percy Shelley and they were talking about this strange little creature that Erasmus Darwin had and that in some way it could be compelled, ordered to move. And some believe that this created in Mary Shelley's mind the idea of an entire corpse being reanimated. Now unfortunately at a later date when Mary Shelley talked about uh, Erasmus Darwin she referred to the single cell organism as vermicelli, the pasta, which is a lot more tasty than vorticella, the single cell ciliate protozoan. Another science that was exciting high society was anatomy. Again you could go and watch an anatomist at work in an operating theatre. And this is all very ghoulish, of course, as well as being terribly scientific. The bodies were normally those of the poor, which could actually be legally impounded for scientific inquiry. Anatomists in London and in the Scottish capital, Edinburgh, dissected these bodies in front of excited and curious audiences. As we saw with galvanism and the use of electricity to reanimate corpses, anatomists could also access bodies from the scaffolds, and there would often be uh, scuffles, fights, between the family of the person who'd been hanged and the doctors or their agents who were trying to retrieve the bodies for anatomy dissection. But the gallows and the deaths of the poor didn't satisfy the demand that was coming from anatomists and two very enterprising gentlemen, William Burke and William Hare, decided that they had a solution to how to provide bodies to anatomists and they murdered 16 people. The scientists asked no questions, the bodies turned up in surprisingly good condition Burke and Hare got their money. Well, eventually they ended up on trial. One turned evidence against the other, and the execution uh, involved uh, one of them being skinned, essentially, uh, it, by an anatomist, and that skin being used to bind a book. It was in this rather chaotic and amoral period of scientific development that Mary Shelley essentially poses the question, when does science go too far? But how did such a demure and a civilized lady as Mary Shelley come up with such a gruesome piece of horror? Well, in my research, I found a newspaper article from 1831 when Mary Shelley was uh, producing an updated version of Frankenstein. And she describes in her own words how she developed this hideous idea, as she called it. She first of all said that, well, she'd been writing all her life because both her parents were distinguished literary celebrities. Her father was a political journalist called William Godwin, who some people argue was the first anarchist thinker in England. Her mother was Mary Wollstonecraft, who was a very well-known 
feminist author. In fact, as a complete aside, a few years ago I found a um, 1790s edition of a book by Mary Wollstonecraft in my father's library and I took it onto a TV program called Four Rooms where I sold it for £1,600. I know it's roughly the same in dollars these days um, and it cost me absolutely nothing. So uh, I'm very fond of Mary Wollstonecraft. And by the way, the illustrations in that book were by William Blake, if you're a fan of him. Mary Shelley, by her own admission, was a massive daydreamer. And uh, she grew up in Scotland near Dundee in a landscape that many found dreary. But for her, for some reason, it unleashed her imagination. To his credit, her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, always recognised that there was a great story locked inside his wife, and he was always encouraging her to put pen to paper. And it was, it was, Mary, uh, it was Mary Shelley, really, who hesitated to get on with it. That was until Lord Byron threw that completely wild party. And I think while having a the 19th century equivalent of a disco nap during that party, she began to have one of her daydreams and that story coalesced in her mind and Frankenstein was born. As she later wrote about this daydream, I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with an uneasy half vital motion. Mary says that she was completely terrified by this vision and realizing that the public would also be terrified, well, she had to write it up. In the years that followed, Mary Shelley wrote that she became actually very affectionate uh, about Frankenstein's monster, not least because it reminded her of a time when her own husband and Lord Byron were alive. Both these men would die quite young. Their deaths were suitably melodramatic. Percy Bysshe Shelley, Mary's husband, uh, went on a boating trip. There was a storm, the boat capsized. His decomposed body washed up several days later and then was cremated on the beach. The, the heart somehow survived and ended up being buried in a church in England. He was only 29 years old. Lord Byron, uh, meanwhile, went on to fight for Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire. He was a huge supporter of Greece. And while besieging a fortress at a place called Lepanto, he became grievously ill and he died. His heart remained in Greece, appropriately given his love for that country. But his body was then sent back to England. Now, fans of Lord Byron wanted him buried in Westminster Abbey, which is traditionally where poets of his stature would be laid to rest. But the church authorities said absolutely not. Byron had a, a reputation as being rather decadent, possibly an atheist, and also there was a rumour that he got his half-sister Augusta pregnant, so that was definitely a no-no for the church. Instead, he was buried in a church in Nottinghamshire, and Byron was only 36 years old. After Mary Shelley's death in the mid 19th century, attitudes towards the Shelleys and Lord Byron kind of hardened. They were seen as being the, the bad boys and girls of Regency England, and the Victorians wanted to put that kind of thing far behind them. One article I found in 1890 in the Morning Post talks about um, Mary Shelley and her friends being atheists and free thinkers, uh, that being a bad thing in the point of view of many Victorians. And her work was kind of dismissed. She was seen as having been a one novel author and that was it. By the way, if there's something I've missed out or you want more information on or you just want to comment, then comment below, please. Despite the sneering directed at Mary Shelley, Frankenstein became very famous in the 19th century. And in the 1860s, the anti-slavery statesman Charles Sumner even referred to the Confederacy as the soulless monster of Frankenstein. 
Frankenstein took off very quickly as a theatre production with audiences loving the story of this monster being reanimated. You can imagine uh, how gripping that would have been for audiences in the 19th century. However, the decision in 1887 to do a comedy burlesque version of Frankenstein bombed very, very badly. Dr. Frankenstein was played by a female actor, Nellie Farron, while the monster was played in a very camp style by an actor called Fred Leslie. Now, this burlesque was intended to be, you know, a bit of Christmas entertainment for people that year. Um, Dr. Frankenstein even had some female love interest with a character called Tartina, and uh, there was also a vampire called Visconti. Other characters included somebody called Demonico and another character called Vanilla the Dancer. Trouble is, nobody was laughing. In fact, audiences hissed and booed at this Christmas burlesque, even though apparently the staging and the costumes were fantastic for the time. People apparently were screaming, we don't want pantomime and where's the clown? London audiences could be pretty unforgiving if they didn't like a theatre production. After a week, this burlesque closed, but nearly a century later, we get the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which in many ways echoes what this theatre production in the 19th century was trying to do. Uh, it's very camp, and we get Frankenfurter trying to create a butch monster in his laboratory. So it chimes really strongly with what those people were trying to do in the 1880s but failing very badly. And similarly, we have the classic comedy movie Young Frankenstein, directed by Mel Brooks, where we have the ludicrous spectacle of the monster singing the 1930s classic Putting on the Ritz. Now, before we look at how Hollywood treated Frankenstein, remember to hit the subscribe button for more horror content. When Hollywood came to dealing with the Frankenstein story, it tended to go for that kind of burlesque, treatment and less the Mary Shelley version. So Frankenstein does tend to become this rather campy brute. The first movie version of Frankenstein was made by the Edison Film Company in 1910 and it's a typical uh, kind of vaudevillian Edwardian treatment of the Frankenstein story. There's a lot of kind of, oh, woe is me acting, and the monster, of course, is furious because uh, he wishes he'd never been created, or for that matter, been so ugly. The action takes place in a single room, which regrettably has a very large mirror, therefore reminding the monster just how hideous he looks at every opportunity. But it's really the talkies that breathe life into the Frankenstein story. In 1931, in the early days of the talkies, we get the movie that's simply called Frankenstein. And in the same way, at the same time that Bela Lugosi defined what Dracula was going to be in Hollywood movies, so the English actor Boris Karloff defined what Frankenstein was going to look and sound like. It all came down to a high forehead, bolts in the neck, and lots of oh, grunting. Bela Lugosi was actually approached after his success as Dracula to play Frankenstein and, uh, well, wisely or unwisely, turn that down. In the 1931 movie, there are two scenes that were censored for many years that were deemed to be uh, too over the top. One is where Frankenstein kills a little girl by a lake uh, and the scene where he throws the girl into the lake, uh, that's part of the uh, sequence, was removed uh, because that was deemed to be uh, just too excessive for audiences. And the other is when Frankenstein has created the monster and obviously comes out with that classic line, it's alive, uh, another great moment in that movie. But he also, in the original version, claims that he is the equal of God. Well, in the more religious 1930s, the censors said, uh-uh, you are not going to claim to be God, and that was taken out. In 1935, Karloff reprised the role, and this time he got a bride, and boy oh boy, her image is not one that you're gonna forget in a hurry with that kind of lightning streak through her hair. It's become really quite iconic. The actress who played Frankenstein's bride, uh, Elsa Lanchester, just as a piece of uh, celebrity trivia, would pop up 
about 30 years later, in Mary Poppins as the nanny who is leaving as Julie Andrews takes over the house. In 1948, the comedy duo Abbott and Costello brought out what would be the first of several movies that mashed up their kind of vaudeville comedy style with the horror movies. Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein was a huge hit though by all accounts. Uh, the two comedians weren't very keen on the idea when it was first put to them. Now I've got to confess I've never been a huge fan of Abbott and Costello. To me they're a kind of nasty version of Laurel and Hardy but re-watching the movie recently I have to say the death scene of Frankenstein where he's basically burnt to death is something I think audiences today would would not find funny and is definitely massively unpleasant. Uh, more of a genuine horror movie than a comedy movie. But you tell me what you think. If you thought the Abbott and Costello movie on Frankenstein was genuinely funny, tell me. T tell me my, my sense of humour has gone and I'm completely wrong. Of course Frankenstein went through the obligatory hammer horror movies mill and Christopher Lee uh, played the role of Frankenstein. He also played Dracula, so unlike Bela Lugosi, he felt able to play both Dracula and Frankenstein. And Peter Cushing, who was an actor he often partnered with, played Dr. Frankenstein. Christopher Lee decided to focus on his Dracula role and dropped the Frankenstein role, which was then taken up by other actors in the Hammer Horror fold. And David Prowse ended up playing Frankenstein. Now you may know that name because he was the guy who went on to play Darth Vader in the original Star Wars trilogy. In 1973 there was an attempt to recapture the spirit and the ethos of the original Mary Shelley novel. So we have Frankenstein the true story. It's not really the true story because it goes through an adaptation, a rewrite, by the LGBT poet Christopher Isherwood. Now he was very well known, uh, he had been well known since the 1930s. In fact, his semi-autobiographical work, Goodbye to Berlin, was the basis for the movie Cabaret, starring Liza Minnelli. Now he wrote this adaptation of Frankenstein with his partner, his long-term partner, Dan Batchardy. And what I find very touching uh, and quite appealing about this version is that Frankenstein's monster is actually born, uh, created rather, as a very attractive, handsome young man. And then we have to watch this young man deteriorate because something has gone wrong with this experiment. So he goes from being an attractive, handsome young man that Dr. Frankenstein is quite proud of. In fact, there's something quite homoerotic in all of this, and he's in society and he's loved, but then he gradually deteriorates physically. And he doesn't understand why the doctor then excludes him from society, and he becomes angry and, of course, murderous about that. And I think the idea of a kind of uh, a kind of regression, a kind of uh, downward slope for Frankenstein's monster, starting from beautiful to ugly, is really quite appealing. In the end, uh, Dr. Frankenstein's monster and the Doctor end up in the Arctic having a kind of confrontation and both of them are killed by an avalanche. The movie also introduces a kind of evil character called Dr. Polidori, played brilliantly by James Mason, who you may remember from the Hitchcock movie North by Northwest, and he comes to a memorably grisly end when Frankenstein's monster pulls him to the top of a ship's mast during a lightning storm, and he's then hit by lightning. Now, I mentioned in a film that's in this playlist uh, about Dracula that the black exploitation genre in the 1970s uh, created a movie called Blackula for African American audiences, and at the same time in 1973 we have the movie Blackenstein. Very topically for that time, it centers on a character called Eddie, who's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he's stepped on a landmine, he's lost his arms and legs, and so there's a Robocop type operation to create a new him that in the end creates a monster. In the early 1990s, uh, Francis Ford Coppola directed the amazing Bram Stoker's Dracula, and he then produced 
a Frankenstein movie directed by Kenneth Branagh, intended to do more or less the same kind of thing, to take the story back to the novel, to recapture that 19th century interest in experimental science. Kenneth Branagh takes the role of Dr. Frankenstein and Robert De Niro as the monster. Now, I have to say, from my point of view, love Robert De Niro, didn't think it was his greatest role, and reviews were decidedly mixed. Uh, again, if you don't think that that's the case, if you love that movie, tell me why in the comments below. There has been loads of Frankenstein-influenced TV and films. One of my favourite is a British one called The Frankenstein Chronicles, a kind of detective series set at the time of Mary Shelley with the actor Sean Bean in the main role. And he's a kind of, as I say, a kind of um, uh, early 19th century detective trying to find out who is this mysterious figure in London trying to reanimate the dead. You may have seen the series uh, Penny Dreadful, which was set initially in London, had a character called Victor Frankenstein, uh, played on a lot of the kind of horror themes of the 19th century. I thought it was brilliant and great atmosphere. It then crossed the Atlantic and kind of lost its way and then got canned. And then a movie it's impossible to dislike, Edward Scissorhands, which is a kind of Frankenstein movie where the creator is Vincent Price, who was a veteran horror actor, great voice, you might remember him from the Michael Jackson thriller video. He creates Edward Scissorhands, uh, who has scissors for hands. He's unable to age, uh, he's the kind of darling of American suburbia for a while, uh, and the movie was directed by Tim Burton very much in his style. In 2011, uh, Danny Boyle and Nick Deere brought out a stage production of Frankenstein with Johnny Lee Miller and Benedict Cumberbatch, and they kind of alternated the roles of monster and creator to great effect. And a movie version of the stage play was done, and I recommend that you find that and watch it. In the 1960s, Frankenstein got a very kind of goofball treatment that was very much in tune with that era. So there were two sitcoms uh, from rival TV broadcasters. One was The Munsters, where you had Herman Munster, a very kind of, you know, goofy character, very chatty, very funny, who is the kind of de facto head of the household. The Munsters aired on CBS between 1964 and 1966, and ABC retaliated in the same time period with The Addams Family, which of course is hugely famous. And the Frankenstein-type character in that household was Lurch. Now Lurch is different from Herman Munster, doesn't say very much, isn't actually mute, which some people assume that he is has a kind of dry sense of humour, but quite different from Herman Munster. Slightly more menacing, but uh, you can see the Frankenstein influence in there. Frankenstein's popped up in various music uh, pop videos over the, uh, over the decades. In 1973, the Edgar Winter Group had a massive hit with an instrumental prog rock uh, ditty called Frankenstein, though. Quite why it was called Frankenstein is anybody's guess. I can't, uh, I can't work out why it was called Frankenstein. If you know, do tell me. And then in 2022, Rina Sawayama had a big hit called Frankenstein. And if I get the gist correctly, it's about wanting to be put back together to sort out her problems. Uh, great video. Uh, I, I get the idea of a kind of alter ego of herself uh, at this party causing mayhem, but look, I'm not in the right age group. If you can tell me what that video is all about or the song, please do. Now, when I talked about Dracula in another film, I mentioned some of the fan groups and organizations that are around today promoting vampires and Dracula. I haven't found an awful lot, to be honest, uh, with regards to Frankenstein, though I dare say there are fan clubs out there, and please feel free to contact me and I will promote you on the channel. More than happy to do that. Well, that's enough about this tragic monster that was born from the fetid and overactive imagination of Mary Shelley. Uh, her dreams apparently were not sweet. I hope that yours are. So until we meet again, sweet dreams.